there is the question of just how healthy and how safe is healthy and safe enough, and just how much is a healthy life worth. Now, in this concept of a healthy workplace, just how safe is safe? How safe does it really need to be? Now, these could be arguable issues of difference between an employer and an employee. Naturally, it would be desirable to have an absolutely safe workplace with no chance of any accident or mishap ever occurring, and that would include even being free of catching somebody else's illness. Now, that could be the overall desire for the worker. An employer, on the other hand, would probably shout, Wait a minute, that's impossible, you can't do that. Well, there is no way to ensure absolute safety. And so that's where the negotiation process comes into play. So in the ethical argument, the issue of safe can arise, and just how safe is safe enough. Well, it's common for companies to hire experts to come into a workplace and evaluate just how things are going, what a company has been doing to maintain safety, and maybe what a company should be doing, and beyond that, how much it should be willing to pay for it, and just how much it actually is going to cost. Now, the problem with this approach is that it ignores the input of the employees themselves. Now, they can feel like slighted stakeholders, and they're affected after all. Now, it is of value in a contract or a work agreement. And a third issue is that such a study can be taken to mean that there are risks on the work site that people can choose to do or not to do. And finally, it can disregard the concerns for a safe workplace altogether. Now, a way to deal with widespread safety issues in the workplace is through government intervention. In 1970, the Congress formed the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. It's called OSHA. Well, it was extremely, extremely controversial back then. Now, at first, there were the proposals that seemed very nitpicky to business owners. They complained about all of the added costs. And true enough, those higher costs did arise, and they did happen. But then, over the years, with moves to prevent worker injury and to even protect workers from having to choose whether to engage in unsafe activities, it's now been argued that the savings in lives and injuries has well been worth it. Even the employers themselves can have the benefit of now working in safe workplaces as well. So not only did some of the arguments originally say that the new arguments went too far, well, now there are arguments that say that things haven't gone far enough. So we can expect cell health and safety arguments to continue for quite a while to come. Many of the giant companies here in the United States also have operations overseas. Now that brings up a new set of ethical challenges in dealing with people who are from other parts of the world. Now some countries have very strong laws that protect their employees. You take many European countries, for instance, where this is very true there. In those cases, many of the laws can actually be more stringent than the ones we have here in the United States. However, when we get into developing third world countries, oh, that could be another situation altogether. There may be lax laws, there may even be no laws at all in some cases as to how employees are treated. Now as Americans, we can be appalled by some conditions. Now the text does make an example of some Asian countries where the companies don't involve workers to take bathroom breaks, for instance, except at specific times, and all too often, those times are very, very far apart. So, which law should take effect? The United States laws governing United States corporation or the laws of a country in which a United States corporation may be operating? Can an American company be held to U.S. standards all of the time, even in another country? Understandably, there is a lot of argument here. A hands-off policy in dealing with developing countries would be that the company does have the benefit of all that cheap labor. And to raise safety or health standards or due process rules, well, that would just raise the cost. And when you do that, that could be enough to make doing business there less than desirable. And if the company pulls out or just doesn't start an operation there at all in the first place, those people lose their jobs and what little income they do have. And then the argument goes that when you do have even sweatshop conditions, workers get at least some money. That turns into a little bit more money and more and more after that. And then that eventually helps raise standards of living, which ultimately will reach world acceptable levels. So, believe it or not, there actually is an argument that can be made in favor of sweatshops. 
Now, there's been a conclusion that perhaps U.S. standards cannot be expected throughout the entire world. And then there's the concept of Kantian universal principles. Basically, that if people can be treated with dignity and respect, many workplace conditions will improve naturally. At least there can be a point of reaching a moral minimum of standards to guarantee physical well-being of the uh, employees to provide at least decent conditions to eventually someday get out of poverty. Now through this, there are moves to encourage businesses to form uh, developed countries to voluntarily meet standards for the workforce employment conditions, especially in those impoverished nations. The International Labor Office has actually formed what's been called a tripartite declaration of principles concerning multinational enterprises and social policy to do just that. Now, perhaps the most controversial issue in operating in those impoverished third world nations is that of child labor. Now, it's estimated that as many as 250 million children around the world are working, many of those even full time. Now, some are as young as five years old, maybe even younger in some cases. There are some who are in bonded conditions, and you can read that to mean slavery. There are some who are even in armed conflict. They are the world's youngest soldiers, or they could perhaps be in the sex trade. Few ever learn to read or write, even in their own languages, and few will ever even reach the age of 50. That's just because of the sickness and excruciating conditions of the labor that they face. So what's to be done? Well, barring workers under 18 may not be a feasible answer, simply because their families would be financially devastated in those countries. And if they don't work in the so-called sweatshops, then just what will they do? Would they turn to drug dealing, maybe drug producing, or maybe even the sex trade, prostitution? Unfortunately, the answers are few, and it doesn't look as though there are any horizons and uh, solutions that are coming anytime soon.